Hi, in this video I want to talk about network security groups. This is a feature that enables me to control the flow of traffic between VMs in a virtual network. Now as a quick review, previously I talked about virtual machines and cloud services. The idea being, for example, that I actually might have a cloud service that, so I have one cloud service and a cloud service, remember, gives me a virtual IP. That's an IP address that's accessible from the internet. It gives me a, a DNS name. It gives me load balancing. It gives me availability sets, availability control. And within that, I can create one or more virtual machines. And the VMs within a cloud service, they can all communicate with each other. They can do DNS resolution because that cloud service provides a kind of auto DNS registration service. If I have another cloud service, and again, that cloud service would have its own virtual IP and DNS, it gives me load balancing capabilities and availability, etc. And I have VMs in this one. Again, these VMs, etc., can all communicate with each other but they can't communicate between different cloud services unless they go and use kind of endpoints defined on that virtual IP. Uh, they can't resolve names across them. I can't control the IP space. It's going to pick a 10 dot or 100 dot most commonly. If I actually want to control the IP space, if I want to control the DNS servers that are configured, if I want to be able to talk to each other, what I actually do is I create them on a virtual network. And I need to create the virtual network first. It's very difficult to move existing VMs and cloud services to a virtual network. So when I think about, hey, I want to start using Azure and deploying things, I create the virtual network first. And I can define what is that IP space. I could do a 10.172.16 and 192.168, i.e. the RFC 1918 or I can even pick a different IP space. Let's say I as a company got internet, internet very, very early. I have my own class B. I can actually bring a portion of that to Azure as well now. I don't have to use an address space from RFC 1918, but normally you will. So essentially I, I define this namespace. I can define, or so I use CIPR to define what is the IP space being used here, i.e. It could be 10.1.0.0 slash 16, which is like a subnet mask of 255.255.0. 16 bits are being used for the subnet mask. I can define well, who are the DNS servers that I want. That will be sent as part of the DHCP configuration to those virtual machines. So I have full control over that. Now, I don't want one giant subnet. So what actually happens is when I define these virtual networks, if I should jump over to um, the desktop for a second, there we go. I've created a virtual network here. You can see as part of that virtual network, I can pick, well, who are the DNS servers for this virtual network? That's what we sent as part of that sort of DHCP offer to those VMs, saying, well, here's your DNS config. I can also, oh, didn't mean to do the pen there. Let's just change that. There we go. So there's my address space I picked. So I picked a very, very small address space. I didn't need very much. So I just got a 10.0.5. And just a slash 24, so 255.255.255.0. And what I did is, actually apologies. That's for um, point to site, I'm getting confused. That's point to site, so basically um, one machine wants to connect in to that. That's the IP address we would use for those guys. My actual address space for the virtual network is this, 10.7.115.0, so that's 24. So again, that's 255.255.255.0. But I break that into subnets. So you can see I have a static net, I have an app net, I have a subnet one, I have one for my gateway so I can do a site-to-site -site VPN back. But I break that address space down into virtual subnets. And so the way that really works once I've done this, so I would do this first. I create my virtual network first, I break it into subnets first, I define that DNS space, and I can update those DNS configurations later on. This is what I do first. Then I create cloud services and then I create virtual machines. And so if I jump back to kind of that view, 
What actually happens in kind of more detail is if I think about, I kind of have my virtual network. Inside that virtual network, I kind of break it into my virtual subnets. So maybe I have kind of three virtual subnets. So I've got one address space for the virtual network, is that big, maybe 10.1.0.0. Maybe this one is kind of 10.1.1 slash 24. Maybe this is 10.1.2 slash 24 and 10.1.3 slash 24. So each of those is kind of a class C subnet. And then when I create the VMs, I pick what virtual subnet I want to put it into. So maybe I put kind of VM1 in here, VM2 in here, VM3 here, etc. I'm just going to create a bunch of different virtual machines in the various subnets I have. And in my mind, maybe I'm thinking, well, kind of, this is like a front-end subnet. This is like almost like maybe a DMZ, so I think that's a front-end. Maybe this is kind of just a middle tier, and this is a kind of a back-end network. And remember, all of these still sit within a cloud service. There's still a kind of a virtual IP over here, and outside all of this, I have the internet. And maybe what I want is more control. I'm deploying a multi-tier application into Azure. I want to be able to control well, who can talk to what. I created this front-end network, this middle-tier, this back-end network. And I want to control well, who can talk to who. Who can talk to the internet, who can get that direct communication. And that's what network security groups do. Network security groups enable me to create rules. And those rules can kind of consist of uh, a protocol, a destination IP, uh, a destination port, a target IP, a destination port, is it allowed or is it denied, a priority. I have all these different aspects of what those rules are. And I place them into a network security group. And a network security group can then be applied to either a virtual subnet or to a particular virtual machine. Now a VM can only have one NSG, network security group, applied to it. A subnet can only have one network security group applied to it. Now what I can do is I could apply a network security group to a VM and to the virtual subnets it in, and then it will kind of combine those. The one at the virtual subnet first, and then the more specific rules at the VM. And Microsoft has actually has a great article on this. So if I actually go and look about, about network security groups, and this tells you, well, these are what I can define as part of a rule that I'm going to apply into a network security group. So you can see I have a name for the rule, a type, is it inbound or outbound? A priority. So between 100 and 4096, the lower the number, the higher the priority. So if I have something with a priority of 100, that's going to take precedence. That's kind of going to win. Source IP address, either an IP or a CIDR range, i.e. that 10.1.0.0 slash 24. That's the CIDR format. Source pool. Destination IP range, destination port, protocol, TCP, UDP, or wildcard. So let's say it's ICMP, I would pick wildcard if I needed to allow that, because there's no particular ICMP type. And then is it allow or deny? Now there are default rules, and these are actually a great way to kind of understand what's happening. So you can see by default, inbound, and it's kind of one of the lowest priorities, the default rules are very, very low priorities, so I can override them easily. So basically, anything from the virtual network on any port to the virtual network, any port, any protocol is allowed. Now, virtual network is defined as the IP space of the virtual network itself, and also any IP spaces that are defined as local networks on my premises that are connected via sort of a site site VPN or express route. So basically, any known IP space, they can communicate. It's allowing the Azure load balancer, that's a special construct, that's both the external and the internal load balancer. There's a concept of an internal load balancer in Azure, so maybe from one virtual subnet, I'm trying to access maybe another group of services, I can create a load balancer internally that maybe points to maybe multiple SQL servers, for example, or some IIS. So I can actually do load balancing within a virtual network itself. 
So I'm going to allow the load balancer to come in as well because the load balancer has to go and probe. Say, hey, are you there? So I have to say, hey, allow the load balancer to come in. And then I'm denying everything else coming inbound. So I've allowed all communication within the known IP space. I've allowed the load balancer to do stuff but block everything else. Likewise for outbound, I'm allowing all outbound between the known IP spaces. I'm allowing anything to send out to the internet and I deny everything else. So these are very generic rules, but that's probably what you want by default. Hey, allow any communication between known IP space and block things outside of that, except for load balancer. Outbound, hey, I can talk to each other, I can talk to the internet, um, but block anything else. There are these special tags. So the virtual network I talked about already. This is the address space of the virtual network and the connected on-premises address space, those local networks. The Azure Load Balancer, again for that internal load balancing um, for the Azure infrastructure, needed for the health probes, and the internet. I so said I would define these, I would create these rules for myself and I can apply them. And it goes through various examples of actually, just going on scrolling through, different rules. So I create a new network security group, I add or remove rules from it, I can delete rules, I can add it to a VM, I can add it to a subnet, I can delete them, etc. etc. So all the different things I can do around network security groups. And I have some examples, if you go and look at my app, I've got some other examples that goes through other types of application. But where you might want to use it, so why do I care? So let's look at this example. Maybe I'm going to create a rule that says, hey, for this IP space, the 10.1.10, as a target, is allowed to talk to the internet. So I'm going to say, yes, this, I'm going to apply a network security group here. So it's going to kind of boundary around it. You are allowed to talk to the internet. Yes. I'll create another rule or a different network security group, however I want to do it. For these IP spaces, for these subnets, these CIDRs, so I apply here and here, you are not allowed to talk to the internet directly. So now my front end network is allowed to talk to the internet, my middle tier and my back ends are not. I can take it a step further. I can say, hey, front end and middle tier, you are allowed to communicate. Yes. But my front end and my back end network, you are not allowed to communicate. But hey, middle tier and back end, you are allowed to communicate. So I'm now creating a very controlled, structured set of communications. Hey, front end, you can talk to the internet and the middle tier. Middle tier, you can talk to the front end and the back end. Back end, you can talk to the middle tier, but not the front end and not the internet. And again, if I needed a more specific or maybe a very sensitive VM, I could also apply a rule directly to the virtual machine itself. So that's how we think about using these. And this would just be rules. This would just be when I create the rule, I would use that CIDR format. So I would say, hey, source internet is allowed to destination this CIDR, 10.1.10.1.10.0/24. Deny internet to 10.1.2.0/24 and deny to 10.1.3.0/24. Great. I'd probably block all virtual network to virtual network communications. But I would enable, hey, 10.1.1 as a source to 10.1.2 as a target, etc. Et I would go through, I would create those various rules. Remembering if I start blocking virtual network communications, and if you're using the load balancer, make sure you add an explicit rule to enable the load balancer. Or I won't be able to do load balancing, so I won't be able to probe and get that information. Another thing to remember is when I apply these network security groups to a subnet, Although I'm applying it to the subnet, it's not running on the outside of the subnet like an edge firewall. It actually gets applied by the virtual machine, by that kind of network communications. Why that's important is 
let's say I created a rule to deny every single bit of traffic. And I would think, well, that's fine because I'm going to apply it to the subnet. The VMs in the subnet could still talk to each other. That would not be the case. At each VM, it would say, hey, block all traffic. And then nothing would be able to talk to each other. So even though I'm applying kind of the policy, the group at the subnet, it actually then gets applied to each virtual machine inside it. So it's kind of an important point. Um, I can apply rule at the VM and the subnet. And again, it kind of merge those things. It will apply this outside first, then the VM more specific rules. I think it's up to 200 rules in each network security group. So I kind of, I can put a lot of logic into those, but only one per VM and one per subnet can actually be applied. And that's really what the network security groups do. It enables me to very granularly control the flow of traffic between different virtual subnets and even between virtual machines. Remember, I can have the internet as a special rule. It understands the concept of my virtual network and I have that load balancer. So that's just one example where, hey, I'm enabling communication between the tiers directly, but not outside a direct tier, controlling who can talk to the internet. So I hope that was useful. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.